Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. We're here as always to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club, be it staff, players, former players or management. Now we're back in the swing of things with our second podcast of the year and as we record this, we're just on the back of a big three points against Wolves and we're really looking forward to some huge fixtures to come. Neil, you're back alongside me. It's great to see you again. We're a couple of months into into the year. How's 2023 treat, treating you? It's doing really, really well. Not just those three points against Wolves, Zoe. There was the one against Newcastle as well. Four points from those two, two big games. Going to be a really, really exciting end to the season. And I'm really looking forward to today's podcast as well because normally the person that we're here with, we would be looking over their career chronologically, but we're almost looking into a crystal ball with our guest today. So see what's in, in, in the future for the club. It's going to be really exciting. Absolutely. Well, as you say, we've got a superb guest today who not many of you will have heard from yet. He's relatively new to the club and the country, having made the trip across the pond just a couple of months ago. Arriving from the National Hockey League's Tampa Bay Lightning, where he served as Chief Commercial Officer, today's guest is responsible for driving all revenues within the club, expanding the club's community presence and helping increase the globalisation of the AFC Bournemouth brand around the world. So without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Jim Frivola onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Jim, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? It's lovely to be here, Zoe and Neil. Thank you guys for having me. And um, I've actually been excited to to do this for a while. So when I first heard about the opportunity, I couldn't have been more delighted to have been asked and uh, looking forward to spending time with both of you. Brilliant. Well, it's great to have you here. And, you know, we're going to cover so many different aspects over the course of the next 45 minutes to an hour. Now, firstly, we're going to start with sort of the here and now. You've just arrived in the country at the club. What are, you, what are your first impressions of the club? Uh, you know, it's interesting because I had never really spent much time internationally, you know, outside of a couple of visits. I, I spent, you know, a little trip to London with my son one weekend about a year ago. And I went to Monaco a few years ago. Um, but other than that, this was kind of a unique idea to come over and and join Bill in this opportunity over here. And uh, what I can say from my first impression standpoint is the the immense welcome that I have felt from not only the team and the club and the the staff and the administration, um, but just from the community as well and and the support of um, all of Bournemouth and even the league. I've had some chance to, to spend time with in the league. Um, it's been amazingly welcoming, uh, refreshingly so. And the area, what about Bournemouth? I, I guess you probably haven't had too much time to explore. Uh, I've, I've, you know, the, the good part about it is we're still in a little bit of a transition. I've been here, uh, as you said, just under two months. And uh, my wife's been with me for about half of that time. But in the time where she's been back kind of settling our affairs back in Florida, um, I've explored quite a bit. I've done, done quite a bit of walking around and uh, checking out Ashley Cross and checking out Westbourne and uh, checking out Sandbanks and Bournemouth and Town Center and um, Christchurch. Uh, there's so many unique little areas that you know, kind of build it up into this one, you know, Bournemouth kind of community, uh, Dorset, I guess, in, in full, um, that I think I've probably seen one one hundredth of what I want to see. Uh, but what I've seen so far, I love. The beach. Do you love the beach? Have you had a stroll on the pier yet, Jim? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a water person. So that was one of the things that attracted me uh, right away. When, when I heard about it, you know, the first thing I did was I grabbed my phone. I looked at the map. I said, I don't, know, I don't even know where Bournemouth is. I've never been over here. And, um, and then I saw the, the water and the beach, and I called some friends that, that live over here and are from here, and, um, and they said, they described it as the West Palm Beach of England. Um, and that just made me light up because for a large part of my life, I've lived in Fort Lauderdale and Miami and Tampa, which are all on the water. Um, so I'm a, I'm a creature of the water. I love the water and the beach. Um, and it feels like home already, just being by the water. What tempted you, Jim, to cross the pond to take this role on? It's the biggest sport in the world. It's the biggest league in the world globally. Um, I've been in the NFL for many, many years. I've worked in the NHL, obviously, most recently. Um, but this is the biggest global sport and league uh, that you can be a part of. So in my business, in my industry, on the business side of sporting organizations, um, I'm 53 years old and this opportunity comes along maybe once in a lifetime if you're lucky. And I was lucky enough that Bill thought enough of me to, to call me back. 
We've got two major casinos in Bournemouth, and I think there are about 60 in Las Vegas. Do you know, is there any comparisons between the two places at all? So I'm embarrassed to say I haven't been yet. That's of, of all the places I have not been, and I, I gamble. I like to play the games, and um, I like to, you know, to fancy my time through a casino, um, especially I lived in Las Vegas for nine years off with two different opportunities there. Um, I will say I, I saw it on the on kind of the agenda of things in the community that we have is casinos. Um, I haven't gone yet, but I'm going to go this weekend now that you reminded me. I'm going to check it out. I can only imagine it's going to be amazing. Um, I think I think any casino is amazing. So I'm looking forward to seeing what it's like. Don't tell my mum this, and I hope she doesn't listen, but I'm actually a member of one of those two casinos. I've lost thousands down the years as well, Jim. <laughs> so you can come with me if you wish at the weekend. Jim, you... I don't know. You don't sound very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Zoe, have you, how are you on this? No, Neil's been trying to persuade me to come to the casino with him many times, but I haven't quite made that leap yet. <laughs> okay, all right. I'll, I'll give it a whirl. I'll give it a whirl with you. Jim, you, you attended Miami University, a big sporting university. Do you or did you play any sports either now or when you were younger? So University of Miami folks are very passionate that it's not Miami University. Miami University is in Ohio. University of Miami is in Florida. That's more just playful, right? But um, I, I loved my time at, at Miami. It was amazing. Uh, I didn't play any uh, organized sports or collegiate level sports. I played, you know, just more pickup and intramural um, amongst, you know, athletes of my skill level. But I didn't have a, a skill level that took me to um, – I was more of a tennis player. Uh, and a you know high school level football player, but not a university level football player. F- American football, but, but roulette and blackjack do they count as sports or not? Uh, they certainly do in my mind. It's a, and they are uh, games of skill and chance. <laughs> you have to know how to play both. You have to know how to play. But I'm more of a craps man. I don't know if you like craps or not. I, I know what it is, but I know they haven't got it in the casino in Bournemouth, so you could be disappointed. Okay, that's okay. I like my blackjack too. <laughs> Now, Jim, you studied a Bachelor of Science. Would it be fair to say your career didn't exactly follow your studies, or is there some kind of great science behind being this this business leader? Oh, that's just a that's just a title in the states. So I was really more of a communications and um, um, communications major. As I also had a politics and public affairs major, so I was a double major. Um, so my my background really came up. I'm an old broadcaster. So I love the idea of doing this podcast. I, I was a play-by-play announcer for the University of Miami's football, basketball, and baseball teams, American football team. And uh, I ended up working in minor league baseball for five or six years broadcasting the games. So I love being behind a microphone. I'm very comfortable behind a microphone. And um, I learned that in the sporting world. Um, and I thought I was going to be the radio voice of the New York Yankees. That's If you would have asked me what I wanted to grow up and be, I was the, the radio announcer for the New York Yankees. And I was working in minor league baseball. And they said, well, you can either have a job part-time. You come in the summer, you work the baseball season. And then when the baseball season's over, you can go home and tend bar, or wait tables, or do whatever you want to do. Uh, or you can have a full-time job and we can – teach you the business side of sports. I said, yeah, full-time sounds good. I'd much rather work full-time. And they said, all right, well, do you want to be more on the the marketing or sales side? I go, let me, let me go to the sales side and start off my career that way. And uh, that was a life-changing moment. And I didn't even realize it because I never thought I'd follow in the business side. I always thought I'd be a broadcaster. And uh, I was a broadcaster for five years. I did great. And then I realized that there's not a lot of money in that. And uh, the business side had a lot more kind of commercial opportunity for me. Well, Michael B. Jordan stars in the Creed movies, a spinoff from the Rocky films. Now, Sylvester Stallone also attended the University of Miami. Are there any other famous alumni that you know or that you went to university with? Well, a lot of the athletes uh, obviously became very famous. So uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Is, uh, is one of the, you know, he started out as a, a football player, American football player there, and, um, and then he turned into The Rock and became one of the biggest global names in, in the world. Um, there's another musician that, that, Zoe, you might not know, Neil, you might know more, more maybe uh, age appropriate, but uh, uh, Neil uh, Hornsby, if you remember that musician at all now, Neil Hornsby in the range, uh, might have been a, a, a U.S. thing. 
I am actually much younger than I look, Jim. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll remember that. I'll remember that. Um, but uh, I'd say the athletes are, are the biggest ones. Uh, Greg Lugana, so a famous uh, a diver, uh, one of the world's best divers um, over over probably the 80s and 90s. I think he was a, a student athlete at the University of Miami and a, and a really big uh, Olympian as well. So a lot of uh, athletic folks have come out of the University of Miami for sure. You've had a varied and extensive career in sport. Just as we said, we mentioned your, your resume. Can you give us a bit more of a, a detailed look at it? Sure. Yeah. So I got married. I was a, I was the play-by-play broadcaster in minor league baseball, and I loved my my five years doing it. It was some of the most fun times I've ever had. You travel with the team. You're on the buses driving around the country. Um, some of the bus rides were 13 hours long. Some were two hours long, but, but most were five or six hours and you travel and you stay in the hotels and you really become part of the team. And it's, it's what made me fall in love with, with sports and working for clubs. Um, I felt like I was accepted as, an, as, as one of the guys and one of the, the players. Um, and even though I was the broadcaster and I certainly didn't play, uh, they treated me that way. And uh, that, that was just a, a passion that I had. Um, and I knew I wanted to stay in sports. I had some opportunities to leave and go more in the media world, but outside of sports, and I kind of avoided those. Um, but at a certain point, my, I got married and met my wife, and she was from Miami, and I was, you know, I'd lived in Miami most of my life, um, leading up to that point until I went off into the sports world. And I got a chance to join the Florida Marlins. At the time, they were called the Florida Marlins. Now they're called the Miami Marlins in Major League Baseball. And uh, I had a chance to go there and, uh, and on the business side, give up my career as a broadcaster. Hard to do. Hard to give it up. I still think I'm one of the best baseball broadcasters in the world. Um, and there's 30, I think there's 30 Major League Baseball teams. And I always jokingly say I'm the 31st best baseball broadcaster in the world, even to this day. But... I knew I had to, to make a career choice, and the business side was, was the obvious one at that point. I was still pretty young and um, freshly married. So we moved back to Miami. I went to work uh, for the Marlins. About three years later, the owner of the Marlins also owned the Miami Dolphins in the NFL, and uh, he asked me to move over to the Miami Dolphins. I was a, a huge uh, Dolphins fan, still am a huge Dolphins fan. And um, that was, again, another easy decision. Same owner. I just boxed up my stuff on one side of the stadium and the Dolphins and Marlins at the time played in the same stadium. So I boxed up my stuff on one side of the stadium, stuck it on the back of a golf cart, drove it around to the other side of the stadium, unpacked it in my new office. Within like an hour, I had moved clubs. Sometimes it takes you a month to move from one team to another. It took me about an hour uh, because I didn't have to move across the country and certainly didn't have to move across the world. Um, here, I just had to move across the stadium. And, uh, I did my time at the Dolphins five or six years uh, on the on the commercial side of the operation. Loved it, absolutely loved loved being a part of it. Um, but then I was really kind of honored. I got a call to go back to my alma mater, and the University of Miami reached out to me to come and be the associate athletic director, which for college athletics is a is a big deal. It's like one step below the 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 head of the organization, and. Uh, so I went back to, to my alma mater, got to be involved in all sports beyond just football and baseball, whether it was diving or track and field. Um, in the U.S., soccer, um, you know, women's soccer there uh, was one of my favorite programs that I was a part of uh, working with that, that club. Uh, volleyball, tennis, golf, all of these sports kind of fell under my umbrella there. And uh, it, it gave me a chance to really open up my eyes to different athletes and student athletes and what they went through. Um, and that journey and, uh, and to do it for my, my, t- my university was an even bigger blessing um, because it, was, it brought me back to where I went to school. I was walking around campus like I was a kid again, uh, even though I was an adult and I already had kids of my own at that point. Uh, so I did that for a while. The NFL called me. I went back into the NFL world with the Cleveland Browns. I don't talk about that much. It was not a lot of fun. Um, and then I think I did my, my, probably my biggest leap of faith I went to the UFC, which is the ultimate fighting championship. It's mixed martial arts. And it was the first time in my life I was introduced to Vegas. Now, I'd been as a gambler, Neil. I'd been there to, to gamble for, for many, many trips uh, with, with my friends. But to live in Vegas and work for the UFC in this global sport, 
uh, was really exciting. And, and I fell in love with Las Vegas at that point. And uh, if you're not a UFC fan, I highly encourage you to go to a fight and, and see the matches. They're, they're unbelievable. Um, and the, the global nature of the sport, I was dealing with Brazil and I was dealing with Argentina and Australia and Europe and, and Canada and the U.S. And it just opened up my eyes to what a global entity is. And then when this opportunity came around, it, it made me think about my UFC days. So, so that was probably three of my favorite years in my life. And then I'm going to let you pick some, some questions if you choose to. But I leave there. The siren of the NFL called me again. I went back to the NFL to Tampa Bay. And I worked for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Oh, I'm sorry, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, for those of you that are, are fans of football over here, you certainly know who the owner of Manchester United is. It's the same owner as the Glazers that own the Buccaneers. Um, I spent three years, uh, I, I served a three-year sentence there uh, with that organization. And uh, I, while I love being in Tampa, I love the market, and I love my time in the NFL, um, I was glad to leave and go to Vegas to go work for Bill Foley and help launch the Golden Knights. What would you say, Jim, so far in your business career has been your greatest achievement? Hands down, Vegas. Hands down, Vegas. Um, it was the first ever professional team in a city. And that is probably not going to happen ever again in the United States. I don't think there's a city, at least in my lifetime, when I'm alive, there will not be a football, basketball, baseball, or hockey team that will be the first ever sports team in a city in the United States. All the cities are pretty well saturated now. So to be part of the first ever team in a major city was spectacular. Um, to, to do it with so many amazing people from Bill on down, the organization was just littered with amazing people. And to launch a team from the ground up and be part of that experience and build the brand and um, build the fan base and the success that we had, which I had nothing to do with, uh, you know, I'm not involved in the sporting side of any of my organizations, but the success that we had on the ice that first year, we went all the way to the Stanley Cup final. It would be like um, going to the Champions League in your first you know, season coming out of the, the championship here and uh, making it to the last, basically the last, the last game. Um, it was just an experience I'll never replicate again and uh, because you can't capture starting something from the ground up. Tell us about Bill Foley. What's he like as a boss? Amazingly fair. Um, he, he he really has a low ego. His approach is really about the organization. It's it's not about Bill. It's not about um, anything that that deals with individuals. He when he interviewed me in Vegas, the the thing that I took away, I spent a couple of hours with him talking about the job out there before before I started, and he kept emphasizing to me, I want to surround myself with people that don't think for themselves. They don't care about their own success. They don't care about what it what it means for their own benefit. It's what does it mean for the organization? What does it mean for the people sitting next to you, to your left and to your right? And how can we help the entire collective succeed? Um, that can sound like it's lip service, but it's not. He truly believes that and means that. So uh, from a, a, a philosophy standpoint, when you start with that approach that it's about the whole and not the, the you know, it's not about the name on the back of the, the shirt. It's about the name on the front of the shirt. Um, and, and that's really what that means. It's not about, you know, Foley or Frivola. It's about AFC Bournemouth. It's about the Vegas Golden Knights in Vegas uh, or the Silver Knights, one of the other the clubs that he owns. Um, he, he truly believes that. And his goal is to hire good people and and let them make the decisions and make recommendations. If if they if he needs to weigh in, he will. But uh, he really wants you to to run your organization and and uh, and not have to um, worry about second guessing. He doesn't do a lot of second guessing. He he wants you to make decisions, and if you need his help and input, he'll certainly be available. But um, he's really really a great owner. He's I've worked for a lot of owners in sports, and uh, I can count on two fingers owners that I would say are are top notch in the world of sports and he's one of those two. Now we know that he's also a vintner. Have you sampled any of Foley Estates world class wines? Absolutely. Uh, almost hard not to when you work for for Bill. Um, but 
it's not an obligation. It's an opportunity to taste some of the best wines in the world. I'm not just saying that because my, he's my boss. Um, and if you get the chance, I've never been to New Zealand, so he's got vineyards in New Zealand. I've never been, um, but I'm, I'm told it's amazing. But if you get the chance to go to California and Napa or Sonoma, um, these are some of the best vineyards in not just the U.S., but in the world. Uh, Chalk Hill Chardonnay is my personal favorite, um, but there are so many. He's got Lancaster, which is you know, in the Red family. Um, I am a member of the Foley Food and Wine Society. I've believed in it that much. I signed up for the Foley Food and Wine Society. I just think that from an affordability standpoint, his wines are pretty affordable. He certainly has some higher-end ones, but he's got some mid mid-size and lower-end prices. Um, I'm not even joking that Chalk Hill Chardonnay is the best Chardonnay in the world. And the vineyard, when you go out there and you see it, it's one of the most spectacular scenes that you can imagine. They've got, they have this wooden barn that people kind of, you know, die to have their wedding there. And they, they, you know, that they, they book this out in advance for weddings and uh, parties and events. Um, the, it's just a scenic place to be, but it's one of the, most delicious wines you'll ever taste in your life. Sounds like somewhere for a staff trip, maybe, Jim. Well, we've done it for sure in Vegas. Uh, we, we've we got a, a group called the Inner Circle out there that uh, that goes and visits some of Bill's properties. And um, the challenge when you go to these properties is when you go to any vineyard in, in the U.S. or California, or really probably anywhere in the world, too, right? Uh, I think there's some decent ones in France from what I've heard. Um, but... But when you go to these places, you better be prepared to bring your credit card and your checkbook, not because it costs a lot to go. It's actually free to go, right? But you order wine because you taste these amazing bottles and these amazing brands and and, uh, lines, and you want to bring them home with you. So you inevitably order, you know, bottles, cases, pallets full. Um, If if you're like my wife and I, uh, really my wife's the wine drinker, but... um, (laughs) I can't recommend it enough. I do know that we are bringing some. I think there's already some served in the stadium. Um, and I I actually talked to Paul Fudge, uh, you know, who runs our hospitality. And and uh, we talked about trying to bring some more Bill's wines over. So there's going to be an opportunity for supporters and fans here at Vitality Stadium, whether it's for a match or for an event, to, to try his wines. I love it. I certainly think we need one of those inner circles at AFC Bournemouth. I don't know about you, Neil. <laughs> Count me in, so. <laughs> now... Staying with Bill, I mean, he certainly delivered on his promises in the transfer window. Six new faces coming in. How can what happens sort of on the field affect your job off the field? You know, it's a it's a it's an age old question in this industry. Um, how do you let the performance on the field or the pitch or the the you know the ice in hockey uh, affect the business side of the operation and? my whole career has been to not let that get in the way, right? Good or bad, whether we're top of the table or we're 17th like we are today when we're starting this podcast, right? Um, You can't let that impact your decision-making because it's out of your control. I have no say over it. I don't oversee any of the football operations and hockey uh, it, with the Vegas Golden Knights. I didn't have any say on the player side of the business, um, which I'm, I'm thrilled about. And For us, it's about fan experience. And yes, what happens on the pitch maybe impacts people emotionally, how they react. But if we can put on a good show and we can entertain them and we can make sure that when they show up here a couple of hours before a match, they have a good time outside, they have a good time as they're coming in. Um, If we can give them the right content all week long, podcast, website, social media, digital, um, AFCB TV, these are all tools and mechanisms that we can use to make people feel like they belong to the club. They're part of the club. Uh, good times and bad. We know, I know in this sport particularly, that, I mean, we've been around over 100 plus years and people are going to follow this team and they're passionate about it. Um, so we don't let what's happening on the pitch dictate what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that we treat you in a first class manner, in a world class manner every single day. Every single time you come to the building, whether it's for a match or not, uh, we want you to be a member of our family and have a good time. And that's my motivation day in and day out. Well, Bill said publicly that the capacity here at Vitality Stadium is inadequate, to put it in his words. What's the latest on, on plans for a new stadium? Are we that, that far ahead yet? It's, it's definitely on the radar, right? It's definitely the capacity is a challenge for us, 11,300 
two or whatever the, the exact number is, is it's just too small, right? We've got to get to 20,000, 22, you know, somewhere, somewhere in that range makes sense. Um, stadiums are never easy. We built in, in Vegas um, an arena for the minor league hockey team, and it took some time to develop, right? You've got to get the land situation settled. You've got to hire designers, and then you've got to go with architects, and then you've got to go with contractors and builders. Um, then you've got to put shovels in the ground. Uh, I can tell you that Bill's commitment is to figure out a solution to increase our, our size. Um, you know, I think I have a pretty good feel for which way he wants to go, whether it's renovation or build a new stadium. Um, and a new stadium sounds great to me. Like, I love, I love that idea. It's a good opportunity. For us, it grows our fan base. Uh, it gives us a chance for more people to come to our matches. Um, it gives us a chance to host maybe some other events in town, whether that's a concert or a boxing match or um, international events, international friendlies. Wh- whatever the case may be, having a bigger ground and more capacity will make that easy. But it's also going to increase the experience, right? We we don't have enough. We get it. We don't have enough points of sale here. We have people queuing up to get food and beverage offerings that shouldn't have to stand in lines. Um we know this when, when people talk about it and I see the people on social media and they're, they're reaching out to me and they're saying, you know, what can we do that we don't have to queue up outside 1910? Well, we're going to do something about that. Like we're going to open up a stand uh, that's going to allow people to come inside earlier than, than when the stands would normally open up um, because we don't want people queuing up outside. And if it's raining outside, we want to give them a place where you can get some weather protection. So we're hearing you. We're listening to things like that. It's just hard at this ground. And it's not an excuse, it's an explanation, right? It's, it's easy to make excuses, but it, this is an explanation of where we're at, but we're not going to let that limit what we're going to try to do. So we're trying things. We're, we're going to try some things that give you a chance to come in a little bit earlier. We're going to try some things that give you a chance to get more points of sale opportunity. We're working on an idea for the South Stand. Like we've, we've got to get more points of sale there during the match. Um, there's certain rules and regulations, that we have to follow. So we'll follow them and we'll make sure that we get the, the advice of the, uh, the security folks and, and the league and, and our safeguarding and, and kind of, you know, the processes that we have to do, we're going to honor those processes. But I can assure you it's on our radar. It is not being missed. Um, and hopefully over the next you know, coming months that people are going to notice that we're making some, some tweaks around here to make it a more enjoyable experience while we're at this facility under this current structure. We might be talking sort of 10 steps ahead, 15 steps ahead here, but when plans do go in place for that new stadium, well, plans are in place, but when we get to that stage of potentially being in a new stadium, does consideration need to happen as to, you know, what what would happen with this stadium in this space that we're currently, we've currently got now? Well, we don't own this building. So, so that, that might not be our decision, right? So that, so I think that's probably first and foremost. Um, and, and it's, you know, we have to make sure that the new stadium is the plan. So there's a couple of steps we get there to, to get to that point. And, you know, Bill will certainly be the final barometer on those things and we'll weigh in and give him some recommendations. But um, there's so much history here. We have to make sure we honor that history. We have to make sure we honor the traditions from, from this building if we move into a new building or even if we renovate this building. We want to make sure that we don't take away things that might be important and meaningful to people here. So, so much to consider. Um it's such a lovely neighborhood, and we have to honor the people around it too, and and you know know that that they are going to weigh into these decisions and have have some voices and opinions on what takes place here. I drive up every morning, and shame on me because I don't actually know the name of the street that we come down with all the beautiful trees lining it, and I see the green fields off to the you know out the window that we're here in the boardroom looking out at now. It's one of the most stunning grounds I think that we could have a stadium near and uh, I love where we're at Um, it's just making sure we do it the right way we get we get the people involved we talk to folks uh, we understand what they would want out of a either a renovated building or a new building all those conversations are coming and you'll have a chance to weigh in you'll have a chance to to put your voice to it it must excite you hugely because as you say there's so much potential there's so many things to consider and you know we are in such a beautiful location. There is so much to look forward to. I, I get excited every day. And it sounds really cliche, but I really do. There's so much that I'm still learning. Um, you know, my wife said it best. We were, we were sitting at a match and um, the, the supporters were, were chanting a song or some, some theme or some message. And my wife says to me, she's like, 
what are they saying? And I go, I don't know. So I started asking and I got people in the, at the club sent me things. So these are things I'm learning. So because I want to sing along, I want to cheer along and my wife wants to cheer along. And you'll notice we started putting some of these lyrics on the scoreboard last match. And we're going to do more of that um, because there are young fans that maybe are learning like we are. Um, and we want them to feel like they're part of it and they know our traditions and they know our history. Um, I'm in, you know, not even two months in and I feel like I have so much still to learn. Uh, I'm I'm embracing that every day. So for me to wake up every morning, come here, I'm learning so much about not just the club, but about our people, about our our staff, the the folks that I go to work with every day. You guys, um, you know, the, the 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 people on the pitch certainly, but the people that I am in the in the grocery stores with, and that I sit at in a restaurant next to, and um, when I I went to the women's match uh, two weekends ago, and I just started talking to folks out there. Like I I want to talk to everybody, and if you see me, please come up, say hello, uh, tap me on the shoulder, and I'm happy to talk. I, I would love to connect with folks. Jim, you spoke about a few tweaks you've made. You've only been here a couple of months. Anybody coming to their next game, whenever that is, what may they notice? That's a great question. So. Um, we are working on some of the, the the branding around the stadium. We just want to theme it out a little bit better. So because we're trying to do it in the middle of the season, it's going to come a little bit piecemeal. So um, I don't know when this podcast is going to air, but uh, we're working on a stand right now that, that'll be um, refreshed, right? It's, it's just going to be cleaned up a little bit. It's going to look a little bit different when you show up. There's going to be some more branding, some more of the the theming of the club around it. And that's going to happen with every one of our stands. Uh, we're going to, if you walk up from the train station, walking towards the South stand, um, you wouldn't know whether the, the South stand was Vitality Stadium, anything to do with the club or a Costco. It, it just doesn't have any appeal to it. When you come for the match against Manchester City, and or if you were here for Manchester City, if you're listening to this after, it's going to look different. It's going to just have a little bit more appeal to it. Um, those are little things. Those are things that we are doing just because we know we're going to be in this building for uh, a, a bit, right? You know, whether it's a refreshed building or a new stadium, it's going to be it's going to take a bit. So we're going to do those types of things because we feel like it needs to. Uh, Bill was quick to to invest some funds into that, um, and then I talked about what we're doing with 1910 and the queuing outside there. And we're going to create, uh, we're going to open up the, the main stand, one of the concession concourses. We're going to open that up a couple of hours early uh, so that people can go inside and, and get some food and drink if they want to and watch the, the football matches. So uh, you'll be able to come in earlier than you ever were into that main stand and not have to worry about a line necessarily to get into a, a 1910 uh, or the Balfour or whatever. There's a couple of names that we have for it. Um, so that's that's something that's going to be new for this next match. Um, and these are things because people have voiced opinions about it. I've seen it on social media. They've said things that bug them and we're listening. We had a we had a supporter that reached out about kind of the accessibility for wheelchairs to get into the superstore and just making it a little bit more accessible. The next day we adjusted it and tweaked it. Like little things that mean so much to to one person are important. It's not just the masses. Um, so no idea is a bad idea. I I don't want to promise that we're going to do every single thing. Everyone's going to email me or or or, or tweet out at me. Um, but I'm going to pay attention to it and I'm going to try to to do the things that we can make the most impact on. And uh, it's it's going to come in baby steps. I will tell you this. I, I won't give away too much because we're still. We're doing some tests, um, but our game presentation is going to look different. It won't look different in the next match or two, um, but I promise you before the end of the season, you're going to see stuff in our matches, pregame, halftime, etc. that's going to look different. We're going to utilize the scoreboards more. We're not going to go crazy. It's not going to be um, the Vegas Golden Knights show. Um, but it's going to be things that I think our supporters are going to love and 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 appreciate and things that are just going to require us to take a little time and patience, get the right people involved to do it. But I promise you, you're going to have a much better time um, experiencing the match when we're done. Something that perhaps the supporters won't see is a new training ground. Jim, where are we with that? It's going to be so important when it happens. And I know that that's a lot further forward than a new stadium. It's underway. 
I, I think that the public number has been, you know, kind of reported 35 or 40 million. It's it's somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, you know, all depends on how well of a job we do building it. Um, but uh, that that was honestly something that was a big priority to Bill. And I know that that was started prior to Bill, the thought process on that. So it wasn't kind of, you know, Bill's baby, but he has really embraced this idea and kind of allowed this to move forward uh, under his ownership. And Bill believes in, and he said this publicly, I, I remember when he was here doing his press conferences when he first took over back in December at the end of the month, he believes in making the experience for the, the players and the club first class. And whether that's a new training ground, whether that's a revitalized stadium, a new stadium, um, I, even the little details. So in, in Vegas, the players, once a week, um, Bill makes sure they get their cars washed. It's a small little detail. It's a minor thing. But around the league, players started talking about, these guys have great facilities. They've got a first-class owner. He washes your car once a week. He washes your car. Not he doesn't. Bill's not out there washing the cars. Maybe he is. I don't know. But I haven't seen him. Um, but, But these are little details that when a guy is deciding to come to a club, and he hears the reputation of what we are investing in from facilities, what we are investing in with um, treatment of players and healthcare and, and the training rooms and the grounds. We want to be top of the league, not just part of the league. And it's those things that will start changing players' minds and keeping guys that maybe would have left or, or maybe getting a new guy in. Um, that's just Bill's philosophy. So it's all about facilities. It's all about uh, taking care of the club. Jim, I will say I've been covering the fortunes of the club for a very long time and I was fortunate enough to go to the what's going to be the new training ground and absolutely blew me away. I couldn't believe that this facility was going to be used by the club that I've been following and I'm sure supporters will be pleased to hear that. It's going to be great. I mean, it, it, I've seen the designs. I've driven out there. I've seen, you know, the work's already started, right? They've already started working on it. Uh, it's about an 18-month proposition, so hopefully by the end of next season, um, the guys will be moving over there. Um, that's also kind of a trigger point for us that'll move along what we're going to do with the stadium here because where they're training today, um, that's an important piece of real estate. Um, and where the pavilion is, where the training ground is today, where the building is, uh, that'll open up more opportunities for us to kind of re-energize what we're doing inside Vitality. So as the first team and the club move over there, some of the spaces inside this building can be more for the fans and be more for hospitality and be more for the experience when we're here. So there's so many different triggers of what that's going to do, not only for the team on the pitch, but for the fans as well. Huge opportunity, huge, huge opportunity for everybody. Now, Jim, Americans love an underdog story and there's no bigger underdog story in football than AFC Bournemouth over the past eight to 10 years. How can the club sort of tap into that American market to boost its audience? Yeah, the globalization of kind of our of our brand is very much important to us. Um, and it's not hard when you think about 25 years ago, which sounds like a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago in, in the, the general scheme of sports. Um, some of the brands that are big brands today were not big brands 25 years ago. Um, even 10 years ago, some of the big brands in the league were not as big as they are today. So it's not a 25-year proposition. It's, a, it's probably shorter than that. Um, certainly, the success of the club in the last 10 years plays a big part of that. Um, and the visibility of, of you know, the television broadcast for the Premier League on NBC in the U.S., on all of these different broadcast networks across the globe um, is going to make it a lot easier for us to, to do. You mentioned Michael B. Jordan earlier. Um, that certainly helps, having, having a celebrity owner uh, part of the mix and such a recognizable actor, director, uh, producer, and, and what that can mean for us from a, uh, just to see him wearing a Bournemouth scarf and, and wearing the gear uh, as he's doing interviews and his, and his press tours for the movie Creed Three, which by the way, I don't know that we've publicly talked about it, but Michael bought out a movie theater here in town uh, this week and invited the, the, the club to come out. And the entire first team was there in the theater, coaches, staff, players. Um, and, and he wanted the club to see the movie, and it was a nice gesture. And um, it's just that level of cross 
promotion between somebody like Michael, cross promotion with a club like Vegas, um, and then taking advantage of India and the US and China and all of these markets where the Manchester United's and the Chelsea's and the bigger clubs historically have taken advantage of that. We've got to tap into that. How are we going to do that? I've been here less than 60 days. Uh, certainly don't have the secret sauce just yet, but Bill's committed to multi-club model. He's talked about that openly. Uh, we've got uh, international marketing minds that we're talking to. We've already hired some folks that are going to help us with that regard. Um, it's a big, big priority because we've got to focus on Bournemouth and then take the next step out, focus on you know Dorset, take the next step out, focus on the whole country, take the next step out, focus on uh, on the entire world, right? And those don't happen overnight, but I can tell you um, that's an ambition, a big ambition. Certainly a, a very exciting one as well. Now, before we move on to some quick fire questions, I've got to ask you, we've talked a lot about your job and you, but, but what do you do away from here and, and football and ice hockey as it, as it was before? What are your hobbies and interests? Oh boy, um, three kids. They're all in uh, university in Florida. They all go to Florida State University all together, which is kind of neat. Um, so they're, they, my wife and my kids are my number one. Everything, everything re revolves around them. Um, we had a vote when I got the job offer from Bill, would I take the job? And um, I, I jokingly say that, uh, that it was a four to one vote. Um, but my, my, one, my one son who grew up a, a fan of a different club, uh, their, their color is blue. Um, I quickly had to convert him, quickly had to convert him over, but that was easy. Um, but it was unanimous. It really was a unanimous vote. My, my family loves this sport. Um, they're the ones who introduced me to this sport probably seven, eight, nine years ago. Like I followed it. I worked for the Glazers um, begrudgingly and understood um, what it was all about. And certainly from being a professional, you know, kind of on, the, on my life career in the industry, I knew what the sport and the league was all about. Um, but from a fandom standpoint, it was my kids that introduced me and made me a passionate fan. So I'm all about them. Whatever they want to do, I'm going to do. Um, beyond them, I like to golf. Um, I understand this country is, uh, has a history in golf um, that uh, I can't wait to experience. I've not golfed here yet. I did just bring my golf clubs back the last time I flew back here about a week ago. So I've got my golf clubs. I'm looking forward to, to playing some, some golf here. I, it, it sounds like you could play year round, which is great. Um, I guess I'll need a little rain gear. Don't mind that. Um, and uh, golf's my thing and I like to walk. I'm a big walker and I love the beach. So I couldn't picture a better place. Golf, check, you know, year round, Good weather. There's no bad snow. It's not horrifically cold. Check. Uh, beaches, check. These things kind of fit my lifestyle perfectly. We will definitely be having the Ryder Cup back off you this year as well, as I can tell you that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to see that challenge. I'll have to probably play that one a little bit more neutral. Just one final question, Jim. You're a father of three, like you've said. People sometimes will lose sight of that when they're taking aim at you on social media, this, that, and the other. What's it like being a father and having, you, you've left your kids behind, I would imagine, while they're at uni? Yeah, yeah, and they will they won't come. My wife will be here full-time. Uh, she's been with me off and on for the last two months, but she'll be here full-time in a couple, probably two months. We still have to wrap up some things. It's hard to move. Um, there's a lot of things I didn't realize. Getting a bank account was hard. Getting a car was hard. Finding a house is hard. Getting my cable set up was hard. So there's things that uh, that have been challenging the last two months. But um, the kids are, they can't wait to come visit. So that that's gonna be that's gonna be fun. Um, I think I think for me, getting them over here as often as I can is is gonna be easy. Uh, I think that'll be that'll be uh, relatively simple. Um, I can't wait to have gone through a full cycle here. And to start a season, to finish a season, to see how we, how we, you know, kind of evolve in our life here, um, travel. These are the things that that get me excited every day. Ten really quick questions for you: Tom Brady or Michael Jordan? Michael Jordan. Roast beef or roast turkey? Turkey. Scoring a goal or keeping a clean sheet? Scoring a goal. Bahamas or Barbados? Bahamas. Never been to Barbados. Jaws or Shawshank Redemption? Shawshank Redemption. Starter or dessert? Starter. Oh, starter, really? Yeah, like mozzarella sticks or, you know, spinach artichoke dip, something like that. Al Pacino or Marlon Brando? Pacino. Skiing or surfing? 
Skiing. Cream tea. Well, wait, skiing mean Ooh. snow skiing? Snow skiing. Snow skiing. Cream tea or fish and chips? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> is that a neither? What is cream tea? Cream is that tea. hot tea with cream in it? It's not. Neil, Neil will be able to explain <laughs> better. To cream tea. Neil loves a cream tea. Have you heard of scones? Yes. Scones and jam. Yeah. Served with afternoon tea. Okay. It's a cream tea. Oh. You can get it for as little as 25 pounds around here in some of the hotels. <laughs> cream tea for sure. Cream tea. I like chips. I don't mind fish and chips, but cream tea for sure. Cream tea. And then final question, red or black? <laughs> um, I'm going to answer black. I love both. My, my my oldest son's favorite color is red, um, and his name is Reed, so R E E D. So it's almost spelled like red. But I'm going to say black because some of the things that we're doing around the building have been, we we're you know painting some things, and we've been using a little bit more black. So black. Brilliant. Some supporters' questions to finish with, Jim from Simon Mason. What's the hardest challenge you have experienced so far in the role, and what are you most excited about for our future? Um, I'm going to give you two challenges if I could. Um, the, the two hardest challenges, one, learning the rules of uh, not just the Premier League, because, you know, every league has their own rules, but governmental rules, um, things, you know, things that are, you know, licensing procedures. That, that's been um, a challenge and that's not a not a really super difficult challenge. Um, and I think the other the other one is just the, I would love our fans and supporters to to know um I hear you. I, I, I understand you. You reach out to me. You talk to me about the stuff on the pitch and what's going on on the field. And uh, and I know that 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 you want me to to react to that. I just won't. That's not my place. That's not my job. That's not my role. Um, I'm not involved in those decisions. So um, I appreciate the feedback. And I think people are kind of getting it because it's kind of tailed off. Um, but you want to talk to me about about the business side and the 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 what we can do in the community and how we can improve things around the building and sales, marketing, hospitality, uh, community relations, um, expansion. Happy to talk. Biggest positive and negative about living in the UK so far. Wow, that's great. I I have to tell you, I I love the proximity to everything. Um, I've been now to London. I've been here less than two months. I've been to London probably four or five times already. I think that's fantastic. Even traveling, I went to our match against United. Um, even traveling up there was was you know was great. Went to Brighton, and I can't wait to take little plane trips. So the the proximity to other countries is something that I can't wait to experience. Uh, biggest negative: all of the things that you plug into the wall. My wife says I have to rebuy. She thinks her hair dryer is going to blow up. She thinks our coffee maker is going to blow up. She thinks all of these things are going to blow up. I would love for the world to get on one system. And if it's this system, that's fine by me because I live here now. Um, but but figuring out, if I, am I really going to have to buy everything brand new because it's going to blow up? Oh, here's another one. This is, I don't understand why the dryers here don't dry your clothes. Do you guys have this problem? It takes like two hours to properly dry a load of laundry. Maybe it's just in my apartment, the, the, the dryer I have. Is that an issue here? I, I would say my dryer is about, about three hour spin. It's not ideal. It dries it, but it, it takes about three hours to dry it. Yeah, we, to do a load of laundry is like, a, like you got to carve, you know, you got to set a day aside to do one load of laundry. That question was from Ross Davenport. This one is from Danny Whitelock. Can we start selling bolty pies on a match day? Much like the cream tea. I'm not sure what that is, but can we? Probably. I don't know what it is. I'll talk to Paul. It's like a chicken curry type pie. I won't let the fact that I despise curry factor in. I'm not a big fan of curry. So Danny, I apologize. I'm not a big fan of curry. That's not going to impact whether we can do it or not. Certainly would look into that. Andy Smith is asking, what is your favorite gif? <laughs> I, I, do, I do know that I love my gifts. If you follow me on Twitter, um, shameless plug at Jim Favola, um on Twitter. Um, there, there's my, one of my favorite ones is uh, it's the actor that I, I don't know is I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but he was in the, the series uh, Kenny Powers um, and uh, he's been in a number of movies, but it's him 
popping out a, a folding chair to sit down and listen to someone's feedback and reaction. I just think it's great. Whenever someone says anything controversial, that's my go-to gif. I pop that out because I love to see the comments. I, lo- I, read you, I, I read all your comments. I really try to read them all. Uh, and I kind of get to it at probably 10, 11 o'clock at night, which doesn't make my wife all that happy. But, um, but I, do, I do love my social media. This one from Charlie Mason Williams. Would you be open to renting out the AFC Bournemouth pitch once again for events that will bring fans closer to the club? Depends on what he what he's talking about. If he, you know he's thinking about a birthday party or hosting um, um, Beyonce, right? Like we're open to ideas around the building for sure. Now, Tom Ellaby, again, you've you've sort of you've sort of mentioned things, but what's your current plan for small, medium, and large changes to improve the match day experience? You've mentioned the bar, you've mentioned work on the south stand, you mentioned scoreboards. Is there anything else that that you perhaps haven't mentioned that that you're keen to share on that? Yeah, I think um, w- figuring out points of sale is is probably a, a big topic. Uh, at at some point, we've got to make it easier for fans to to you know get a pint, to get a pie, to to be able to you know in the south stand. Um, I've heard people say I can't even buy a buy a beer, can't buy a pint. Because of the way that that we're that we're structured and the, and the rules of the league and things beyond our control. Again, explanation, not an excuse, right? But these are legitimate issues. So we're looking into that and, and we're planning to to figure out a way to to fix those things. Um, I said on Twitter the other day, nobody hates more than I do someone not being able to buy something easily. Um, that's why I'm here is to, to make, make your life easier to, to engage. And it's not selfishly about driving more revenue. Certainly that's, that's an important part of any business. But um, if you want to buy a pint in the South Stand, I don't have an answer for you today. I'm going to get you an answer. Sam wants to know, has the heart on sleeve nature of football fans taken you by surprise at all? No, because I had done quite a bit of phoning around the league and, and talking to folks that um, that not only have come from the U.S. over, because I do have a number of friends. Uh, I'm, I'm friendly with um, Tom Glick, who's the, my counterpart at, at Chelsea, and um, Todd Klein, who's at Tottenham, and I uh, know some folks that have over the years have worked at Villa and, and some other clubs. But I've also talked to folks that um, are from this country and have been in this league a, a lot longer than maybe somebody like me who's coming over from the U.S. So I'm trying to get a good cross-section of learning. But the one thing that everyone has said is it's it's a more passionate and hard on sleeve uh, fandom than I think you'll see in the U.S. I've learned that already. Um, I appreciate that. I embrace that. I would, if that changed, I'd be sad. That would make me sad. One final question from Luke Vincent: Where do you see AFC Bournemouth in five years' time? Wow. Uh, I will not speak about it from a football perspective because again not not my not my place um i just think that it's going to be a, a a club that uh from a a, a local standpoint everyone's going to be even more proud of than they are today and i think there's tremendous pride in, in the club today um i want you to think of our club as world class and i think in five years we'll be world class plus Wow. So that is my goal. That is my ambition uh, from the perception of the club is to elevate it. No matter where we feel like we are today, we're going to have to elevate it. Otherwise, we're not we're not a successful operation. So think of our club as world class and world class plus is my goal in five years. Wow. World class plus. There we go, Luke. You heard it here first. Now, Jim, thank you so much for coming on our podcast, for giving up your time. We've had some brilliant stories. We've really enjoyed your company. And it's been great hearing about where the future of this club might lie. Zoe, Neil, I, I can't thank you enough for having me. I'm happy to do this as, as often as you like. What are you guys doing tomorrow? <laughs> Looks like we're going down to the casino, eh, Nez? Playing golf. There you go. I'm in for all the above. All <laughs> the above works for me. How about a cream tea? I'll try it. <laughs> I'll even buy, even at 25 pounds. <laughs> Well, Jim, thank you so much, as we say. If you've enjoyed listening to our podcast out there, we'd absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, whether it's AFC Bournemouth fans or the general football fan, or maybe in this case, the general ice hockey fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Jim Favola and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle. Thank you for tuning in to our official AFC Bournemouth podcast.